Hello class and welcome to this Rad Racer NES walkthrough right here on Video Games 101 by way of Let's Play with Brigands. I'm your instructor, Professor Brigands. Rad Racer, also known as Highway Star in Japan, is an excellent racing title for the NES and one which is very light on items or bosses. So light so that neither exists. Uh, this is sort of by design. We're doing this this week. Our resident items expert and boss guru and Blaze and Gary respectively are uh, taking the week off for spring break, so it's just Fluff and I for you for this one, but still a great game and a lot of things we can help you out with. In terms of difficulty, Rad Racer is pretty challenging, actually, in terms of racing games. I'm going to go ahead and give it a 7 out of 10. On the frustration scale, this equates to punching a hole through the wall. Typically, if you, you know, you're, you could just see that flag, but you run out of gas, or just time, better said, is the, uh, the real enemy in this game, that and all the other jerk-offs on the road. Haven't said jerk-off in about 10 years. I apologize for my language class. I don't know where that came from. But uh, let's go ahead, get started, run the intro, and get into this Rad Racer walkthrough right here on Video Games 101. All right, the first thing we need to do is select our vehicle. We have two choices, the Ferrari 328 Twin Turbo and then a generic Formula One racing car. There is no difference between the two in terms of handling or speed. It's just an aesthetic difference. Although if you ch uh, choose the Formula One car, all the other cars on the road will be Formula One cars. Whereas if you pick the Ferrari, then you get a different uh, breed of traffic, I guess is the best word for it. Uh, per stage. It's first stage, it's the Volkswagen Beetle. This first stage isn't too difficult. This makes it a great time to take a look at the controls for Rad Racer. Very simple. B is brake, A is go, gas. You can pause to start, hit select to toggle the, uh, the 3D mode. I don't recommend this unless you have the glasses and it's been at least an hour since you've eaten. It gets a little eh. Otherwise, hold up once you hit roughly 88 kilometers per hour, kilometers is what we do in, for this game, to uh, to get that turbo going. And uh, other than that, that's pretty much it. We hit down to change between three different soundtracks uh, for each level on demand. And then we have just the sound of the road as well. If you ever hear me changing the type of track midway through the race, it's simply because I'm panicking and accidentally hit the button. So now let's take a look at the Briggs notes. Very important for this game. These are the keys to making sure we make it through the eighth and final course. First, drive conservatively. I like to apply this uh, technique, this strategy, what have you, to virtually every racing game I've ever played. Oftentimes I find that if you don't just go crazy, if you just kind of obey the rules of the road and don't uh, get too aggressive, oftentimes it'll work out for you. That means don't crash. Essentially, that's the bottom line when it comes to Rad Racer. If you crash, especially after the first couple few levels, you're probably not going to be able to finish it. Unless you're driving really well otherwise. Busting all the records otherwise. But, uh, so this means braking when you're going in the turns. If it's getting a bit to be a bit too much with the drift, you see yourself going too far to the other side. We'll talk more about how to accomplish this as we move on. But in the same vein, stay inside on turns. So if you see a turn is coming up on the right, then you want to stay on the right-hand side because at top speeds, high speeds, you're going to drift farther to the left. So you want to stay as close to the inside of these turns as possible. And then uh, next, pick your lanes based on the traffic. The traffic is far and away the most challenging part of this game. If we were just driving on some windy, turny roads, that'd probably be nice. You know, be a nice little Sunday drive. we got our Ferrari 328. I would love that. But no, we have to deal with all these other douchebags on the road taking up our lane, changing lanes when we don't want them to. Uh, that was very dangerous right there. We'll talk about the bizarre physics of bouncing off other cars as you move forward, but... When I say pick lanes based on traffic, I basically mean stay behind another car in that lane. The reason for this is that the other cars don't obey a lot of rules on the road. They adhere to two rules, best I can tell. 
One, everybody in town has to buy the exact same car. Not sure why, but uh, it's a major sticking point for them. Maybe that's why they come at us so aggressively. The fact that we don't own a Volkswagen Beetle in that first stage, or here in San Francisco, we don't own a Corvette. So everyone decides we have to die. And two, no two computer-controlled cars, at least, can occupy the same lane at the same time. So that's very important for us. So we know that if there's a car ahead of us in the lane, and we can occupy that without having to worry about any other traffic or anyone sneaking into our lane. It's basically a safety blanket. And the faster the car ahead of you is going, which means, you know, the longer it takes for you to catch up to them, the better, because that gives you more time than not have to worry about other cars. You just focus on the turns, and what a beautiful game it becomes at that point. Number four, yes, we are still in the Briggs notes. Know how to continue. Just hold A and hit start if you run out of, uh, well, there's only one life, but if you lose on a stage, just hold A. Once it uh, starts over, hit start. You'll get to restart on the same screen. And lastly, don't use the power glove. It really is that bad. But anyway, while we're working on San Francisco, still not a especially challenging track. It doesn't really start to ratchet up the difficulty until I say about LA, maybe the fifth stage overall. So while we got some time, let's bring in Fluff to learn our first Fluff fact about Rad Racer for the NES. Fluff, what do you got? Rad Racer was made by Square, aka Squaresoft, or today known as Square Enix following the two companies' merger in April of 2003. While Rad Racer sold well, the company continued to lose money and was under threat of having to declare bankruptcy in 1987. It got so bad that it inspired them to name their next North American release title Final Fantasy, as they genuinely believed that it would be their last game unless it sold well enough to keep the company afloat, which, spoiler alert, thankfully it did. Rad Racer has received positive reviews, though many criticized it for being derivative of other racing games which preceded it like Sega's Outrun. Overall, most consider it to be one of the better racing games ever made, certainly for the NES, as Square struck a very nice balance of speed and challenge in the form of the track design and the other cars. They weren't able to recreate the same satisfying racing experience three years later with Rad Racer 2, but by then, they were on their way to churning out classic RPGs, so it's all good. Yeah, I'd say Square, uh, they, they rebounded just fine, weathered the storm of the slight disappointment that was Rad Racer 2, although I, I did kind of like that game growing up. Only two tracks in that one, but they were both pretty good. Get the, the main adventure theme, as I always thought of it. I think it was called Jungle Crash or something, and he had, like, the chill theme was the other one. But, uh, man, you think they could, like, be bothered to put more than two themes in the game, but... Anyway, I digress. We're about to finish this one up. Been using a lot of the slipstream to great success here. Look at that, 27 seconds left on the clock. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, just driving conservatively the first Briggs note as we head to the Grand Canyon is uh, enough to get you, in my experience generally, through the first seven tracks of this game without issue. I think it's only until probably the, uh, the eighth and final track here in Red Racer that you have to take some risks and just kind of drive aggressively the whole way through. But anyway, eventually we're going to have an issue with the other cars See, they get more aggressive with their lane changing, but again, we have that, they all adhere to that rule. Well, one of everybody having to have a Citroen in uh, Colorado for some reason, or whichever part of the Grand Canyon we're driving around. But also, uh, that, uh, yeah, one car per lane. All right, so I thought it would start a little bit later, but it seems like here in the Grand Canyon, we're starting to get our first glimpse of cars just driving unbearably slow. You know, there should be a separate track for cars who are content to go under 100 kilometers an hour, but yeah, a lot of these cars look like they're basically stopped in the lane, and uh, they come out of nowhere, so it's an extra obstacle we need to account for now. It's not just the turns left and right now. You need to be ready to brake whenever you see a car just flying toward you or try to get out of the way. That one wasn't going quite slow enough to crash into, but yeah. Yeah, obviously if we clip a car, just drive straight into a car that's going too slow, it causes us to crash like that one or that one. 
we can break ourselves to get within a window. Unfortunately, I don't know the exact math on what it is that it, you know, maybe like if there's like a hundred kilometer difference between your two speeds or something, that'll cause a crash. I don't really know how they program that, but I just know that you need to be careful. You need to be on the lookout for these cars. So just one more monkey wrench. And the, uh, the LA course, which we have coming up in a couple, is notorious for having a lot of cars that just can't be bothered to maintain the speed of the rest of the cars on the road. It's that thing where it's like a lot of times kind of the worst drivers aren't the ones that are speeding, like the craziest drivers, but they're the ones that are just going way too slow, and oftentimes that's more dangerous than anything else. But, uh, but I digress. While we're still crushing it here in the Grand Canyon, got a full 70 seconds almost to finish these last three ticks. Oof, that's dangerous. Let's go to Fluff for another Fluff fact about Rad Racer. What do you got, Fluff? Red Racer makes a memorable appearance in the 1989 film The Wizard. As the protagonists are traveling to California to enter a video game competition, they meet a bad boy named Lucas who shows off for the group by demonstrating his video game prowess with Rad Racer while famously using the Power Glove, a controller accessory for the NES in the shape of a glove. While being an officially licensed peripheral for the NES, it was actually designed by Samuel Cooper Davis for Abrams Gentile Entertainment and manufactured by Mattel in the United States. It was based off of more advanced technology of the Data Glove, albeit with a simpler or better said cheaper design. And although it looked cool as hell at the time and sold nearly 1 million units after coming out just before the 1989 holiday season, the peripheral was discontinued after less than a year. One factor was its hefty, for 1989, $75 price tag, which would cost more than twice that today, adjusting for inflation. But just as importantly was that consumers quickly discovered how poorly the device translated to virtually every single game on the system. In fact, we can attest to firsthand as to how bad it is. We have one in the TA lounge, and we even feature one in the intro. Yeah, it really is bad. I was so excited when I got it for the first time. Plugged it in with its little sensor bar and everything, and, you know, followed the instructions on keying in the, the programming for whatever game I was playing, and I just... I don't know. I guess I just always held it on a kind of pedestal. I didn't pay attention or just didn't hear all the bad reviews at how awful it was. Just uh, focused on thinking how cool it was. But yeah, just... It's just not practical for most games. I think they only made two games specifically which utilized the controller, put in special controls, which you could use with the, uh, the power glove. Just never really caught on, but still looks cool. Glad to have one in the collection. Mostly use it as a prop at this point, but I'm glad to have it. As we are now dealing with uh, what a bunch of Mercedes, I suppose. Mercedes Benz is here in Athens. Definitely not uh, a linear path we're taking here. Colorado, with San Francisco to Colorado, okay, that's one thing, but then we jump all the way to Europe. Not really sure, I just, you just go where the challenges take us, I suppose. Is this even a challenge? I'm not sure what's going on here. We make up our own idea about what's going on. Some anonymous billionaire who just appreciates good driving wants to see us go up against uh, Uniform cars, that was dangerous. And, uh, and eight tracks across the globe. There you go. Someone write that screenplay. Let's see that movie. In the meantime, let's get another fluff fact from Fluff. Red Racer came packaged with a pair of anaglyph glasses used to make use of the game's built-in 3D experience, accessible by pressing a select button during a race. Square President Masafumi Miyamoto specifically intended Red Racer as an outlet for utilizing Square Programmer and Programmer at the time, Asir Gabelli, to showcase his 3D programming skills. Gabelli hand-animated the graphics for the game's 3D mode, and, not surprisingly, he was also the lead programmer on Square's previous international title, 3D World Runner. Good call, Fluff. I have to add also, kind of buried the lead, that uh, when we were talking about the music at least, that Nobuo Oimatsu, very famous longtime Square music composer who did all the Final Fantasy games, at least to a certain point, but just 
all of my favorite themes basically from those games. Final Fantasy VI, VII, just classic themes that, you know, bring up so many uh, fantastic memories for me. Did the music for this game, the, the three tracks here. As we head finally now to the notorious Los Angeles Nightway, you think we could have done this after San Francisco, but anonymous eccentric billionaires, you know, you can't try to figure them out. They have their own way of doing things. So this really is where the difficulty starts to ratchet up for my money. Uh, cars are basically just stopped in the middle of the road, all these uh, Lamborghini Countachs that we're driving against here. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's very aggressive driving on their parts. Just sitting in the middle of the road, essentially not moving for our purposes. The major difference between 255 kilometers an hour and whatever they're doing double digits probably but we'll see some uh, especially egregious examples in this one the lane changing is getting ridiculous at this point just pick a lane you know whoa that's what I'm talking about right there um, so the, the slipstream I'm gonna keep calling, going with that you, you know we are technically behind the car we're not getting a speed boost out of it or anything but um, incredibly valuable because every now and then you can find a car that does stay in its lane for the most part until it gets close at least you know when there's didn't even see that one you got to be careful when you're going over a hill you can't see what's ahead of you you kind of have to keep it in you know third gear or something like that but uh yeah when there's three cars taking up all the lanes that's when it's that's when you feel extra safe nice and slow that guy is changing lanes a little bit. Generally, you get to a point where when they're almost beside you that they're not going to switch lanes anymore. Not always the rule, but every now and then they, they seem to calm it down and accept that you're going to pass them at that point, so they just stay in their lane. But Sometimes the challenge is just seeing which lane, deciding and figuring which lane a car well in the distance is actually in, especially on the turns. It can be hard to differentiate that. Square gets their share of uh, their promotions via the billboards in the background on this stage in particular. LA skyline, the horizon. It's a nice effect though, the different tiers in the background moving at different speeds to give you that uh, illusion of depth. And we got a flag coming up here. There we go. Starting to get to the point where we don't have a whole lot of time left on the clock. Still, the conservative driving is going to get all right. Going to get you there. A lot of times we'll barely be uh, the timer's going to be running out, but they spot you that you know it's not an instant loss. Once that timer hits zero, you get to coast. So very important when that timer hits zero that you have. Uh, as much velocity as possible going in your favor. Make sure not to bang into any other cars or anything like that. Just trying to use as much of this... Make up your mind, friend. Make up your mind. This is truly aggressive, but we did it with two seconds left on the clock. I'm trying to think of where we... Ah, the snow white line. That's nice and vague. Some sort of snowy country. I believe the competition here are Lotus Esprits. Possibly. I believe so. While we figure this out, let's go to Fluff for another Fluff fact about Rad Racer. I mentioned the wizard earlier, and the Nintendo gaming competition the protagonists were trying to enter. In 1990, Nintendo actually rolled out the first ever Nintendo World Championship an event which toured the United States to find the best gamers in various age groups. The tour culminated in Los Angeles, where the finalists played a special event, specific limited-run cartridge featuring unique mini-levels for Mario 3, Rad Racer, and Tetris. Each copy being numbered, only a few hundred of these cartridges were thought to have been made, and today they are among the rarest cartridges for the NES, fetching more than $10,000 a piece at sale. Of course, that's nothing compared to the value of one of the purported 26 gold cartridge versions they made, whose value has reached six figures in recent years. 
Good look, Fluff. Yeah, it reminds me of my days of uh, going to video game stores or even just pawn shops. Be careful there. It's a good rule also, I didn't mention this, because it probably falls under that drive conservatively, but conservatively umbrella, but don't drive on the side of the road. There's things that'll crash you over there. It's not a good not a good time. We might coast into this next flag. I want to get as much speed as we can get here. We can muster. Yeah, it's been a while since uh Woo! There we go. It's been a while since I've uh I've gone hunting for NES cartridges. I have a pretty good collection nowadays. Around, I don't know, 200 or 300 to, I don't know, we have a big box. <laughs> My brother and I, all the games we had as kids and then just uh, from collecting in the years after that. Kind of uh, in high school and then college around that time, that's when I really got into looking for these things when I'd be at a thrift store or a pawn shop or something like that. Swing by them, see what they had in. It's always exciting. Never knowing what you might find. There we go. All right, we got a little bit of time back from that one. Let's get your pulse up. Trying to get that next arrow. 18 seconds, this is gonna be tight. Yeah, we might. This might be a coaster if we pull it off. The worst is like when you have three seconds left, and you think you're about to get the uh, the flags, and then you see a turn sign, and you realize you're just not that close at all. Oh my god! Wow. <laughs> Again, nothing special. Just making sure we don't crash. Just keeping a good speed. Now we're going to a seaway and a typhoon. Sounds dangerous as hell, but. Our eccentric billionaire, anonymous eccentric billionaire, and patron, wouldn't have it any other way, I suppose. Watching from a television feed, I suppose, as I think we're taking on some, yeah, obviously Porsches here, Porsche 911s. Brother, as an aside, he always uh, loved Porsches growing up, and then he ended up buying one. I think a, a 1990, might be a 90 actually years and years later, so. I don't think he drives like this in it, thankfully. At least the, uh, the ruling body of all these different tracks, zip codes, whatever, for the rule that everybody has to have the same car, at least they allow you to have, you know, the choice of maybe two or three colors. <laughs> That's something. So they couldn't really program in any kind of precipitation or anything, but I do like the the change in the the skyline there, different colors. As things go dark and then eventually I think we come out of it. Gets a little brighter. Yeah, this is <laughs> I want to use the turbo, but again, we're kind of boxed in right here. This is where we don't want to push it. We don't want to get one of those uh, swipes that sends us flying left or right. Sometimes you can use that to your advantage. If you're hitting a really tight turn and you're losing ground, you don't want to back off your speed. You can just, if you got a car in that far lane, just kind of hit them on the outside, which unaccountably, the physics of it send you the other direction. Never really got that. They kind of fixed that, or at least the, the physics of it in Rad Racer 2. Although again, that wasn't rated nearly as well, so maybe uh, they had it right the first time. I don't know. Clearing up a little bit here. Generally, I like to use each of the themes for depending on what time of day we're doing the uh, the course, but uh, that's all gone out the window. Essentially, it's all gone out the window at this point. As I keep stress accidentally tapping down as we're making the turns here. 50 seconds to get these last three arrows. It's going to be tight. Let's go to Fluff and get one final Fluff fact about Rad Racer. Fluff, what do you got? The two choices of cars in Rad Racer are the Ferrari 328 or a generic Formula One race car. 
The Ferrari 328 was in production from 1985 to 1989, with only 7,412 being produced. The MSRP began at $58,400, which would be roughly $170,000 today, adjusting for inflation. The most one ever sold for recently was roughly $320,000 in 2022, which I think is a steal considering it can hit an obstacle at 255 kilometers per hour, flip several times through the air, and the car and operator will both be completely unscathed. That is true. That was a major selling point, I'd have to imagine, in the late 80s for this particular car. Crash all you want. Won't do uh, any damage to the vehicle or the driver. All right, the last seaside running. We've got to finish strong. Take a look at the, the course layout here. We got a lot of turns in that midsection. Yeah, let's finish, finish strong here and collect whatever the prize is. I don't know. As we're going up against Ferrari's Testarossa's, I believe, this time. Saving the best for last, I suppose. These are easily the most aggressive cars which uh, you will find in this game. And I mentioned, I think earlier, that tracks one through seven, the drive conservative approach will get you through without uh, too much issue. Not applicable for this one. Here we need, to, we need to use that turbo as often as possible. Be a bit more aggressive. We're gonna coast into a lot of these flags. All right, so we have the crazy turn portion coming up. Boxed in here. Oh, this is bad. <laughs> this is really bad. <laughs> just need to get that guy off the screen. There you go. That's rough when you just, you have such a tight window. That could have been, that was close. You have such a tight window and you're just trying to get that other car to scroll off so you can change lanes, but the car in front of you is not letting that happen. Everyone's kind of going the same speed. Being passive-aggressive in their own way. I'll probably go through all the tracks a handful of times each before this one's all said and done. Not too many uh, folks slamming on the brakes on this particular course. I'm not going to rule it out. Uh, are we done? Oh my god. Oof! <laughs> All right, like I said, let's get your pulse rate up. I see something in the distance that we're driving towards, some sort of city. Oof. They could have been more cruel there and put uh, put obstacles on the side of the road before then. That would have cost us. Again. It's like when these turns come out of nowhere, they could... Uh, it could really make you pay. There we go. I think we got this right lane. I like seeing a guy get away from us for a little bit, but we know he's still on the screen. That's the other thing to consider is scrolling them in front of you by going too slow. You want to keep them on. You want to just keep that one guy who's going just fast enough in that lane on the screen so that you can keep taking advantage of the slipstream, quote unquote. Not the theme I intended to end on, but whatever. Just get us in. I know this isn't it. I know there's going to be something else. Any more turns? Yeah, I knew we weren't done. All right. Got to keep the speed up, but at the same time, we can't crash. I think we got it. Oof. <laughs> that could, we literally could have gotten stopped short if we had gotten... Uh, sent off to the left or right by that car. Probably finished feet before the finish line. Congratulations. See you again. I forget if I mentioned this, better late than never, but you can tap B on that kind of intro screen when you're seeing the demo, and you see your RPMs fill up, and each time you press it essentially is for the level that you want to play, and then you just hold up and right on the D-pad 
and uh, press start, and you get to pick up on that course. I love the character animation there. And then she just drives off. <laughs> Steals the car, or just carries on to the next challenge. I don't know. Good times, though. I don't know if we were meant to think that she was in the car the whole time we were driving together. Am I overthinking it? Does it matter? It doesn't matter. What does matter is that we do one of these classes every single week. So, uh, yeah, if you don't mind, go ahead and click that subscribe button to enroll in this class. Hit that like button as well. It really does help us out. Leave a comment. What are your memories of this game? Did you ever have trouble with it? And, uh, yeah, did any of our tips help you out today? We'll be back next week with Blaze and Gary back in their normal slots. So until then, take care, have a great week. We'll see you next week in the same spot for next week's class. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and comment on this video, and click subscribe if you haven't already, as this seriously helps me to keep making great content for you. And check the description of this video to see what song is playing right now. Barry!